uh, they can tell us firsthand experience uh, of how this all works. But first, I'd like to introduce Mix Mixmaster Mike, legendary Hall of Fame DJ. Beastie Boys, so much more, Cypress Hill, incredible. So honored you're here, and great performance last night for those of you who got to come to the incredible uh, Marty Kallner uh, dinner. Uh, we have Mariah Hansen here, uh, who's joining us, who runs an incredible festival uh, in Palm Springs for 33 years, uh, who's gonna tell us a lot of great stuff about talent booking, lessons learned, uh, and much more. And of course, Candice, who's done a bit of everything uh, in the festival business and live event business. Um, and uh, really, these guys have so much great insight, and I can't thank you all uh, enough for being here. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, you know, how'd you guys all get started in your respective uh, roles here in the business? I guess starting with you first, Candace. Um, definitely not a direct course by any means. Um, how it started was by accident, early 20s, best friend was like, hey, you wanna come out to the high desert to this hippie festival for a weekend in camp out? And I was like, Sure. Next thing I know, uh, boy shorts, sports bra, a jug of water, and I was in my element. So from there, I just got involved with volunteering production, uh, kind of from the ground up, and just kept coming back over the years. So yeah, over about 10 years, a uh, free agent and AR, and I jump in and out of festivals and uh, work in producing smaller, intimate live shows. Incredible. Oh, we're so happy you're here, and guys, free agent. So, link up with her later. How about yourself, Mariah? Well, I threw notorious parties in college. Uh, I somehow talked the dorm manager into letting me throw just a small little 21st birthday party in the cafeteria. I promised him I wouldn't charge nor serve alcohol. We had seven kegs of Lone Star. <laughs> it was five bucks a head, and I took everybody out to Denny's for a Grand Slam breakfast the next morning. <laughs> that was the start of my career. Um, uh, <laughs> the next year, I asked if I could do a party in the uh, coffee house, and I promised again, I, I'm sorry I did that the first time, and I, I won't do that again, and I, I did that again. And I think they banned parties at Sonoma State University on campus for years, uh, although I hear they're back up and running. Uh, from that, I segued into something that when I started out, it was, it was kind of pioneering, it's really common now, but a nightclub promoter, where, you know, some nightclubs are packed on Friday night, some nightclubs are packed on Saturday night, some aren't, some are really packed on Wednesday night and Friday night. So I would go into that night that they weren't doing well, and I would say, give me the door, you take the bar, and uh, let me take over your nightclub, and we'll see how we do. And that was always super successful. And that eventually segued into me going into Palm Springs and producing a music festival for the uh, queer community. And I've been doing that for 33 years. Incredible, thank you so much for being here. And I always, there's a, you said something that's pretty interesting. I always, always, a lot of people I meet in the industry always say, if you didn't start in a band uh, booking a basement show or maybe making the zine for that scene, like, uh, how'd you get here? So I love, so many people fell into this business just doing something naturally, like buying some kegs of beer, and uh, it's a natural extension of, of that. But uh, Mike, obviously, you know, a legendary uh, career. Uh, how'd you first start getting involved in music? I said, Mike. Try that one. Yes, hello. Nope. Hello. Oh, Ooh, there we go. Jeez. Hot mic. I got a hot mic. Uh, yeah, you know, I grew up, I'm, I'm a street kid from, um, from San Francisco, and I was just like, you know, infatuated with, uh, with ins live instrumentation there. I grew up to uh, Hendrix, of course, Eddie Van Halen, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Miles Davis, and of course my hero John Bonham, and and I and I just I grew up watching tapes of these guys, and um, ultimately, I, you know, I, I didn't I didn't play any instruments, so then I discovered a turntable, and I'm like, oh, how could I be a Bonham on the turntables? How could I be Hendrix on the turntables? So I found records and discovered records through watching Run DMC, Jam Master J, and um, you could say I'm just an offspring of those guys. 
you know, and I, wanted, I just wanted to play with the same passion and emotion as my heroes. And those are my heroes, and ultimately uh, led me to, uh, hey. Hey. <laughs> it led, led me to uh, forming the first ever uh, DJ orchestra called the Invisible Scratch Pickles, and then, um, then, then, uh, then it led to three world titles, and then it ultimately led me to the doorstep of the Beastie Boys. And rest in peace, Adam Yauk. And if it wasn't for Yauk, I mean, that wouldn't be a part of it. But there you go, all in a nutshell. It's a wormhole, but it's, that's. And this is Diane, everybody. I always say, uh, can you introduce this lovely lady uh, to your life? This is my wife and my. Uh, Hi. My co pilot of life right here, Diane. And she's, yeah, she, she has a lot of insight. And she's like, she's my muse. Everybody needs a muse, right? And she's my muse. Well, Diane, we were just asking everybody how they uh, got their first start uh, in, in this business. You know, obviously we'll get into the nuances of artist relations and talent, but um, we'd love to hear um, some of your origin story. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet everybody. It's an honor to be here today. Um, well, I started off with Joe Weider, and I was a fitness model. That's kind of what I started off when I was really, really young. And, um, and then I, um, I met a guy, I did some calendars, and I met a guy that knew Prince, and I danced my whole life. I was with the New York Ballet Company, and Prince saw me and wanted me to be um, part of his crew. Um, I was quite afraid, because I'm a Catholic girl. So I had to lie to my mom. I told her I worked at a bank for a little while. Um, then she saw me on TV and she's like, is that you, Diana? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then from there, um, I met a guy who um, was the DJ of Headbangers Ball. Mm -hmm. He was my boyfriend at the time. And so I got really involved in MTV on the business side and started like really um, just at MTV every day. And, um, and just gave them lots of ideas, and I worked very closely with John, who was the president at the time. That's where I heard Marty's name everywhere in the building. <laughs> Everybody wanted Marty to do their videos, and I was working with Megadeth and um, the beginning of Metallica, and um, kind of, I've been kind of a, like all over the place, so. Um, and then um, <laughs> Tommy Lee's my best friend, and I helped him with, um, when he was going through a hard time and he was in jail, um, kind of more like a therapist than a friend sometimes. Um, and um, I helped him start Methods of Mayhem. Hmm. Um, because I'm like, you need to get away from Motley Crue. They weren't doing a lot of work at the time. And I'm like, let's start something different. And so I got Fred Dersch. And I like George Clinton because I'm a hip hop girl and soul girl. So I'm like, let's get George Clinton just because I wanted to meet him. And then little Kim was big then. And um, Fred Dersch, um, no offense, I love you Fred, but the music wasn't my vibe. But I'm like, let's get him, because I was trying to use everybody for Tommy to get, you know. And I had gone to, um, to a Beastie Boys concert with Ron Lafitte, um, who was running um, Capitol Records at the time. And, um, and then I saw this guy up there, and I'm like, wow, who's this guy? You know, this is an incredible performer. He took the forum and turned it upside down, and I've never seen a DJ manipulate the turntables. And being from Inglewood, and really growing up in the hood with like real hardcore hip hop, um, I was like, this guy's special. And so I said, let's use him too. Let's get him on the album. So we put together Methods of Mayhem, and that kind of veered me away from my dancing and veered me away from um, you know, um, doing what I didn't really like to do is I kind of get very shy. It's weird looking at everybody looking at me. <laughs> I get really super shy. So, um, and so I wanted to get away from the camera and being in front of the camera. And, um, and so when I met Mike um, at a strip bar, <laughs> we were driving down the street with Tommy and he's like, let's go for my birthday. And, went to the strip bar. and I was not into that at all. Um, I really didn't like it. No, it was, I didn't care about the strippers. I was like looking at that the whole time. It was, it was a true test of who Mike was. Because when I was in there, and I was very uncomfortable, but Tommy kind of tries to get me to do all these things I don't want to do. Um, and he, um, 
tried to give me a cigarette, remember? And I was smoking that, <laughs> like yeah, every I, now and then. I had Godzilla, Godzilla lighter, but I got from Japan, and I was just like, I was, yeah, the Godzilla lighter. Remember the Godzilla lighter? I do. And I was trying to light your cigarette, and then, then I asked you if you wanted to go have a, a burger after. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good line, but. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, absolutely not. I am not going to have a burger after. But the Godzilla lighter kind of was like, wow, yeah, this, right, this right. guy's like Godzilla looking at me and not these girls up here. Yeah. And I told him I wasn't like part of Tommy's kind of girls. Yeah. And then um, that's kind of how it opened up to. Um, that's how it happened. It yeah. kinda, that's how we met and we kind of fell in love and we um, were never really parted at that time. And so um, and at that, the, that, that formed us. it formed our, us. Our yeah. And then DJs were not really doing anything at the time. My dad was sick and I was home with him, so I started a DJ agency called Copeland Entertainment, which is my last name. And then I, um, I got a piece of um, paper towel and I was sitting there with my dad and I started writing down um, my next creation. It kind of reminds me of, um, I mean, Marty would, would influence everyone to like completely innovate yourself and go from one to another to another. Of course, mine was on this very tiny level. Um, and that's the thing about Marty that's incredible. And I, I was going to talk about John Travolta because um, John Travolta um, went from doing Saturday Night Live, every, um, Saturday Night Fever, everybody was disco. And then he did Perfect, and we were all in our aerobics outfits. And then he did Quentin Tarantino, and it's like he actually changed the face of um, just style and, and, and everything that we were into. I mean, I, I've never seen so many aerobic studios in my life disco places, and then Quentin Tarantino with that vibe. And Marty, on a whole different level, has changed the face of MTV, and being at MTV and seeing that all these videos that I had no idea Marty did when he sat behind me at the Laker game, I just thought he was my buddy that was, him and his wife were so beautiful on the outside, and then on the inside, just spectacular human beings. And, and, and just like every day, I'm finding out more and more of everything Marty did. It's just unbelievable. So um, went from that to um, a starting a DJ agency. And, um, and then I had uh, one of the biggest DJ agencies and we, I started the movement in the beginning of DJs making like 20,000 and up a show with DJ AM and I do Travis Barker and kind of that's, that's kind of where I went. And now I'm doing artist development because I'm in a good position in my life and I want to help artists that don't have the opportunity to do what they need to do or trust this industry and managers. That are, um, for me, it's all about music cares. And um, so I deal with a lot of artists that are up and coming that are um, you know, in, in rehab and a lot of them that aren't. So um, that's where I'm at right now is developing these artists. And Andra Day um, was one of my artists who's, um, she just sang the national anthem at the, um, the Super Bowl. And um, so I love finding um, the diamond in the rough. Mike was a little diamond in the rough. Um, and that's kind of what, what I can't think God put me here is just to like, just help people. So I do invest a lot of money that I don't get back ever. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's wonderful to see these young artists growing and changing and becoming something and being confident and being sober. And um, so that's kind of where I am. That's incredible. You actually you touched upon something that, that I wanted to ask all you guys, which is su such a great part of uh, talent booking and live events, of course, is we all ha I'm sure we all have a story of, well, I booked so-and-so before they were famous. And probably the greatest move you know, from a festival standpoint, and I've seen this a couple of times on festivals I've worked on, where when the festival's announced, the name is on the third or fourth line, and by the time you get to show day, they're on the they're on the top line. We saw that with recently with Jelly Roll. Uh, I saw that uh, when Machine and Kelly switched genres. I saw that a couple times. Uh, for you guys, what were some of the experiences you know, in your, in your uh, histories that where you got to get in early and, and what's it like to nurture that young talent and see it you know, blossom? Hello. Um, I think my most favorite one from this last year. I did AR for Cross Festival back in March. Um, and just leading up to that already, it was awesome to see some DJs that were already personal friends of mine who I would go out to their day sets in LA, like Academy, you know, tiny things in the neighborhood. And then to see them here at the afters and everything. But I think especially for me this last year, uh, two of my favorites were Coco and Breezy and Channel Trace. 
Because, uh, okay, because uh, definitely starting out here in the States, but especially in this last year, they both toured internationally, and especially for Coco and Breezy, uh, because as we speak right now, they're headlining. So for me, that was something near and dear to see them up and coming and to do that, and I've been a part of that. Do you feel like uh, like proud mama when you see things like that happen? Yeah, honestly, and I mean, those are the bigger names, but yeah, every time, anytime I go to a show, how I feel is kind of like, not on my show, not on our, you know, just clearing the path, making right. sure all the tech writers, all the everything is according. So you have that free bandwidth to come here and get situated and make sure that you're right, you know, so definitely on the mama bear instincts for sure. That's where I'm coming from. Incredible. And Mariah, you, you, you and I were talking um, uh, before, you know, Mariah has done this incredible festival in Palm Springs for 33 years. So uh, she'll tell you some of the list of names that have come through uh, their doors, but it, it reads almost like a pop culture uh, history, but I imagine so many of them were, you were there early uh, in, in, that, in that story. So my first, I changed the trajectory of the festival probably, I think, in 2006. Uh, we were usually just doing the whole diva circuit, you know, those artists that had had hits 20 or 25 years ago. They're actually still on the circuit. It's pretty amazing. But uh, I booked the Pussycat Dolls when Nicole Schwarzenegger was still with them, and they were unknown. Um, and by the time, and I paid. So more money than I could have ever imagined for a small festival. And uh, the person who introduced me to the idea, she said, just trust me. And by the time I booked them and the time they appeared um, on my stage, they had, I think, five top 10 hits. And so it just went from uh, me being scared to death to looking a little like a genius. But uh, it was pure luck. Uh, but that followed up every year. I kind of developed a formula for the best chance to pick the next big thing. And uh, so I, I think uh, the next year it was Kesha. Uh, the next year, uh, I think I had a double bill Friday night and then Saturday night with Katy Perry and Lady Gaga. Um, Iggy Azalea, Baby Rexa, Lizzo, Jesse Reyes. Um, I'm not even gonna remember them all, but just been super lucky following it. And I'm gonna call it a secret formula because everyone always asks me what that formula is. And I say it's a secret, but. But there are ways to, to kind of get an idea of what kind of a chance an artist has. You have to have an ear for, and, and my expertise is pop and EDM and hip hop. Um, but you, you certainly have to have an ear, but then there has to be things in place because there's so many talented artists out there. Um, and, and all of them are deserving of superstardom, but there has to be ingredients in place to really get there. And, so as a festival, we've been really lucky in that we've hit it enough times where when I first started out, you know, I'm a queer small festival and I would call these agents and, you know, we all know how agents are and I would call and I'd get a secretary and I would call, I'd get a secretary and, you know, oh, he'll call you back and you don't get callbacks. Um, the year that I booked Lady Gaga and Katy Perry together, that was 2009, um, I started getting callbacks, and and then after that, uh, we just kept on consistently hitting it. And I think what's most important, though, I'll tell you, to talent buying, is the experience that you offer your artist while they're at your festival. Because don't be fooled that they're not going back to their manager and they're not going back to their agent and saying either that was an incredible experience or that wasn't. And so we make it a point with my festival to run it like Coachella. We run it top-notch with a top-notch sound, top-notch lighting, and we make the experience for the artists pretty amazing so that when they walk off the stage, they're like, I wanna come back next year. And they tell that to their agent, and then their agent is going to start a relationship with you because they're like, you're doing something, you're not very big, but you're doing something right. And so I think that's been part of the key to our success is that you definitely need to establish relations with the agent, and you need to really create an incredible top-notch experience for the artist so that they go back and speak well about your festival. That's incredible. And Mike, I'd be curious from, from the artist side of things is that, you know, do you guys, do you see it the same way? Do you go play these festivals or events or these DJ gigs and, and sort of report back of like, wow, 
that that Earl Grey tea was really warm, or or whatever maybe you know, whatever the request was, or uh, they made me feel like family, or whatever it is. Do you do you sort of sometimes see the artist's talent side, and the festivals going the extra mile for for the artists? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's there's certain festivals I do every year because I I love to do them. Like there's the Bottle Rock uh, yep. Fest in in Napa. And the funny thing is, uh, they, they asked me to curate a stage. So now I'm like, I've become like, kind of like promoting my A artist. sommelier, if you will. Our artists, yeah, yeah. So it's like, there's gonna be like a Mixed Master Mike stage and I'm, I'm like getting all my friends on, this, on the stage for, for three days. But, but as far as like being at a venue, I mean, they're all different. You don't know what to expect. But you know, for I, I like to I like to stick with what what I love. You know, you know what I mean, and they they know what they're gonna get when they get me up on stage. So as long as, as long as I see those mosh pits, and I, and I see smiles on those faces, and then that's where I that's where I belong. And um, yeah, it's all you know. You, you can you, you don't know what's gonna, how it, everything's gonna pan out in this business, right? It's like it's all it's all intention. I don't know, and it's all fate or it's like. It, it, it's crazy. You just, I'm a visionary, so I like to. Vi I like we we have vision boards all over our house, so I I, I kind of like envision what it's gonna be, and then it magic magically turns out the way I see it, in some kind of cosmic way. It's kind of like I don't know, but but um you know yeah as as long as it's a rager, then yeah it's, it's fine with me. And as long as I got my green tea matcha and my water on my rider, I'm good. I don't do alcohol, I don't do none of that. Like, don't like, mess yeah, it yeah. up. You know what I mean? Like, it's been like that for years, right, Di? <laughs> well, 20 years ago, it was like Hennessy and Coke, but now it's like turn into, <laughs> it's turn into <laughs> my green tea. a little bit tea. more. <laughs> <laughs> no, as you get older, you know, these experiences, they, they stick with you and you're like, oh, you know, I'm not too complicated anymore, you know? I just want, I just want the standard like. Hey, whatever. You are one of the most amazing artists to work with. Um, not because you're my husband, but what? I think it's, I, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're an agent and you open doors or you're a manager. I manage a lot of artists as well. And then you open the door for them and then they don't shut the door. You know, it's like you could just go in there with your guitar and your voice and do what you do. And um, sometimes artists, especially up and coming artists, when you open the door and they don't get it, and they don't get it and they don't get it, they don't understand it's a process and we all get turned down. I got turned down many years because I was little. How are you gonna dance on this big stage? You just have to not give up and keep going and going. And um, with Mike, I open the door and he shuts it every time. And it's, it's not just how talented you are, it's really the class of person that you are. Because um, as managers too, I feel like we have a big responsibility. And just as you were saying, like agents don't take your call back. It's not their business not to take your call back. They, they are agents that are responsible for artists' lives. They should be calling back anybody, any Tom, Dick, and Harry that calls. You never know who's who or who's going to be somebody later. You always have to treat everyone equally with respect. And because maybe I'm more for the underdog, <laughs> I don't know. Mike gets upset. I dress homeless people all the time in his clothes. Um, but he gets kind of bummed at me. But I think, I think, it's, I think it's important to like, um, you know, acknowledge every single person that walks in the room. And that's what Marty does. Marty has always given the, um, I mean, I don't care if you're a janitor or a maid or, or a bartender. If you have an idea, he looks at you and he's like, really, what do you, that's a good idea. Like, let me think about that one. And, and when he works with people, he'll say, what do you think about it? It's like, wait a minute, that's the grip. He's like, what do you think about this? And then he takes their idea and goes with it. He doesn't just say, okay, and moves on. He actually goes with the idea. Yeah, so I, I feel like that's part of being a legend. Please. Well, you make a good point, right? And that's a lesson. It's not just artist relations or talent buying. It's it's a lesson in the music business or any business in life. Like, you, whoever you see on the way up, you'll see on the way down. And yeah. um, please, like, you know, uh, 
I, I still to this day hire a lot of people that were really nice to 16 year old me when I was an intern. And I, they were always like, why, you, why do you hire me? I'm like, you don't remember this, but in 1992, you did, yeah. you know, you did X, Y, Z. And that goes along, it goes longer than you think. Um, and um, I encourage everybody, you know, if you get the chance to be, be a mentor to somebody or be helpful to someone because the theme of all those stories, right? Or as they said, uh, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga can remember that, or all these great artists you know you work with, and also uh, you know you also manage besides Mike the incredible DJ Mugs from Cypress Hill, uh, Rozelle, who um, similar to yourself, Mike. I don't even know how to describe uh, talent-wise how talented that guy is. Human, the real human beatbox. Um, so you know these things are all great. Well, you know my next just switching gears a little bit. I wanted to ask you know especially for the folks here in the audience like. A little bit about what are some of the greatest challenges we're facing in artists, uh, artist relations and talent booking. I know I live more in the in the rock metal side of this world. I've worked a lot in hip hop and country, um, but my lot in life is is rock and metal. Um, so I smile when you say headbangers ball. Um, <laughs> In our world, I think there's a lack of headliners. I think that's probably a realistic thing going on. There's, you know, we've lost Chris Cornell, right, in Soundgarden. We've lost Linkin Park. We've lost, you know, again, Adam Yauch, right? We don't have the Beastie Boys with us today. They should be with us. Um, I'm just curious, in all your respective worlds and genres, what are those, those uh, issues facing the artists and the festivals that you guys work with? Is it budget? Is it, is it, is it talent pool? Is it... Uh, not uh, lack of phone calls back from agents. What, what, what are the biggest challenges? I think what I've been encountering a lot uh, for many DJs and artists that have approached me is a lack of access, maybe, um, or rather a lack of community, uh, if you will. And so that's been one of my biggest passions that I try to do on a community level is facilitate different kind of hubs and creative gatherings so that the artists can really support each other and network and go, hey, I know this production manager, or I just had the lunch with that, you know, that booking agent or come through to tonight's show, you know, it's gonna be a quiet thing. Um, and really just maintaining a living, breathing network and relationships with each other and checking in on one another. Uh, but my, in my experience, I think that's been the biggest thing is a lack of access uh, and a lack of community. Uh, out the gate in terms of how they can relate to each other. Do you think it's because, because I noticed this too, and the expectations of an artist in this day and age, when I was a kid, you mentioned Eddie Van Halen, if we wanted to learn how to play Eddie Van Halen, we had to slow down a VHS tape or something, right? There was no YouTube videos, there was nothing else, and I certainly didn't know what he had for breakfast. Now I could probably, you know, you could look online and Right, a big part of what we do in this industry, right? You could have, you could go to the sound check, you can meet and greet them, you could do this. They'll record your outgoing voicemail message. Um, yeah, a lot more stuff was a lot more stuff. A lot was, more was a, was a mystery, and that was awesome. I that thought was, Jimmy Page that was practiced, a mystery. right? John John Bonham and John, they, they're practicing the dark Absolutely. arts in a castle. I think nothing is a mystery. These no, it's just like everything's all out there. So it's like you know. We yeah. have the learning, you know. I'm just wondering if how much of what you're saying, the lack of access, is due to the fact that the expectation of an artist is so much more than I'm <laughs> DJing for an hour. It's I'm shaking a hand, I'm kissing a baby, I'm doing all these other things, right? Um, yeah, that are out there. I mean, I'm kind of like you, so I'm Long Beach. I'm from the streets myself too. There you go. Uh, and there I you kid go. You Hallelujah. Not. Yeah, no, I kid you not, some of, I've literally wound up on tour buses showing around rock bands that were just in between shows that I met while I was smoking a cigarette outside of an open mic because I roller skated there by myself. I kid you not, that's just, so similar to you talking about, it's fate and just divine order. I kid you, that's how I wound up in the craziest places I have, just doing me. And yeah, as much as everything is online and out there right now, the ironic part about it is that less people come in person to just to just be and yeah. so that's the funniest thing is sure it's saturated yes many people are out there online but how many people just go out there just go and see what happens and that's kind of what I always tell people anytime they're like how'd you go there just show up yep. just show up and just see who you meet that's kind of how I go I think for me, probably the biggest challenge is um, is pricing. I, I think uh, 
right before COVID, anybody who's a talent buyer will remember, I mean, it was just getting outrageously expensive. Um, and then COVID hit and it, it started, you know, obviously no one was working, but we're back there again within only a short couple of years where, you know, an agent's gonna bid you um, the highest price. They wanna get the most amount of money and oftentimes that doesn't fit into your budget. It just depends on how big of a, a festival you are. Um, I always start with what's the fee range and and I will tell you, never ever, they're gonna say to you, oh, how, how much, what, what's your budget? Never answer that question, <laughs> ever, because, and I'll tell you, I had that happen to me once with Carol Lewis, who I love. She's an amazing agent. She used to be with CAA. She has her own agency now. And she said, I, said, I wanted to book uh, Salt and Pepper. And she said, well, how much do you want to pay? And I'm like, this is a long time ago. I said, 75,000? Okay. I've never had an agent say, okay, the minute I made an offer. <laughs> but it was so much more than what they were getting at the time. <laughs> <laughs> she just said, we're, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> um, and that was, um, uh, yeah, that was a deal. That was the hardest lesson I had to learn was that you yeah. never, ever, and, and I, I always write back and I go, fee range, because you're really in control. They make you feel like they're in control, and they're not. You're in control, you're the buyer, and so you have to play by the terms that you create. And the first question is always, fee range, don't ask what they cost. Ask for the range, mm -hmm. because the you know that's going to give you your parameter, and you know, and then and then it also depends on your festival, because like Micah said, if if you if an artist wants to play a festival, they're going to go even lower oftentimes than their fee range if if it's just not in your budget, because they want to play your festival, which is why yeah. again I'm just going to just emphasize how important it is to treat the artists well and not just. Treat them well like, you know, get them their red colored M&Ms. I mean a really awesome sound check. I mean really top notch equipment. I mean a production manager that knows what they're doing, that's on time. I mean that things have to run so well that the artist is like, this is easy. I just gotta go on and do what I do. And, and, and always have a backup little battery for your mic. You know, for me, vi for, you know, vi for me, vibes is way more important than the money. It's all about the vibes and the vibrations and the experience better than money. Money will come later, but it's all about the vibes and the experience together that we can share together at the moment, whatever, whatever show it may be. But yeah, it's all about the vibes, vibrations. I feel like um, the internet has just ruined artists in so many ways. Um, it's, it, you know, it helps um, influencers and they've become kind of like, um, you know, the artist now, an influencer who might do makeup or, and that's great. That's a wonderful thing that they all get opportunity to feel like there's something. So I don't want to crush that either. But I have a particular artist who's, um, he was homeless and he um, did a lot of drugs and really was going to die. He wasn't okay. He is probably the most talented artist I've ever seen. He's got everything Prince has, but he's, um, um, he's like a folky, bluesy guy. And um, the internet is not something he ever wants to do. So I've had to, unfortunately, in a way, not push him because I don't uh, agree with that. But kind of like you go to, he's with William Morris and they've never seen him play. Um, I have, you know, we went to Nashville and um, He's just unbelievable. And so we went there and did a live performance there. And I was just thinking to myself, how sad that this artist is like a diamond in the rough. William Morris signed him with never seeing him perform. And they um, just believed me. And I sent them a little tiny clip of him, like a three minute song. And, you know, it crushes him almost every day. And it also crushes my other artists that they have to do. Um, this fake thing on the internet because he's so genuine he doesn't even want to do videos if they're not real he doesn't want to be fake and sing pretend and so it's it's kind of a catch-22 so in my personal opinion I really don't like what the internet's done to artists it's really crushes their souls and makes them not focus on the music 
I want my artists to be in the studio recording and writing and not thinking of business and having someone they can trust. We need, we need every artist dancing on TikTok. <laughs> that's, that's what we need. That's what we need. I mean, that's a lot of comments I get. It's just the very similar, no matter what the genre is like. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to dance. Yeah, yeah. You know, on, 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 don't His make me dance on Dirt TikTok. Miller. Yeah. Yeah, Dirt Miller. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, I see that and, and I see them really wanting to quit. A lot of my artists are like, I want to quit right now. I can't do this. I don't have time to post all these posts. And just like what you said, it's really about the agents. And we're doing the Bottle Rock um, stage, the DJ stage, and you know, working with Tom, and he's wonderful. I love the Bottle Rock people. But I've worked with many other um, big festivals, and, and you know, it's like they make so much money. Give the give a bone, like give the artist just a little bit more money. I don't even take my commission sometimes because I'm like. That's too much money, like, just take more. And sometimes Mike gets upset about that, but I just feel like, you know, it's all karma. It's, it's karma and it's all about, um, you know, if you're in a good place and share the wealth a little bit, you know? And so I'm all about the artist, maybe because I'm an artist, that that's why I feel the way that I do. But I love everything you, you all have set up here, so. That's great. Uh, final question before we take some uh, questions also from the audience. There's a lot of, of course, uh, of our colleagues here uh, uh, in the room and some, some young folk, as they say. Uh, what, uh, what, you know, what advice would you uh, sort of impart uh, some, some folks here that might be wanting to get into uh, artist relations or talent booking um, and maybe something that you, maybe you wish you, someone had imparted on you <laughs> early on? Um. Yeah, I would say unapologetically just get clear on who you are within your essence and authenticity and identity because what I've learned the most and what speaks the loudest and any of, if you want to call it luck with the artists that I've reached out to, isn't just, hey, I've seen what you've done. I think my best success overall in general isn't just, hey, I've seen what you've done, but I like what you're about. I'm picking up what you've been putting down. I've been reading between the lines. I like that story. Hey, I feel that actually. And at that point, they're kind of like, wait, well, who are you? What's that about? Wait, you could see me? You saw that? You noticed that? Mm -hmm. And that's also for me how I'm navigating authentically. Because yes, I feel it with the artists in general. I don't, ironically enough, like being performative in that regard, you know? Um, and I think that's been the most successful responses I've received from people is because out the gate, I don't want to come to you in any other fashion. So I would say take that time to sit with yourself, learn what that language is and that authenticity and that identity. Because at the end of the day, that's what people are going to want to connect with and remember. So yeah, that's for me. Good advice. Um, I, I think on that line, I, I, I do think that um, it's a very, it looks like a very glamorous industry. I think when we're in it, we know that it's not. but. It looks like it from the outside, and uh, it's a lot of hard work and, and, and a lot of, of heart. And I think that to get into this industry, I think you have to get into it for the right reasons, because it can also be a very powerful position in life, and it can be very ego-based. And um, that's not going to last a long career. It'll last as long as it lasts. But the long careers are the careers where there's an authentic passion about what you're doing and why you're doing. Um, and I think along that line, uh, I think it really is about relationships. I, I think that if people are operating from the relationship is the most important aspect of what you do. And in that, that's treating people well, that's treating people with dignity, that's treating people um, the way you want to be treated. Uh, I think that's going to serve you really, really well. So for me, relationships have always been important. And like you had talked about, I do, my sponsor is Tito's, and I have had Tito's for, I think I've been in festivals for 33 years, I've been in the career 35 years. Tito's, I think, been with me for 31 of it, but it was not always Tito's. At first it was Miller, because that's where Brian Hurley, he worked, and many of you may know him. Um, and then when Brian Hurley, he moved over to Bacardi, it was a relationship. And so he said, hey, I'm with Bacardi now. I want to sponsor you as Bacardi. And I'm all awesome. And then Brian ended up with Tito's. And now Tito's is our sponsor because I won't leave Brian. It doesn't matter who he represents. 
I want to work with Brian because I know I trust Brian. I have a relationship with him, and he has one with me. So that's that's a span of a thirty you know, five year career, and I've had a relationship with one of my sponsors for you know thirty one ish years of it. That's how important relationships are. I love that, and it's probably a, a conversation for another time, but uh, a glowing example of what you just said there of, of uh, how the people on the stage will never be replaced by uh, AI. Um, that, you know, that type of stuff and those relationships and that human element to what we do um, cannot be uh, done in any other, uh, other way. And I know what you're talking about with those, I have similar relationships with sponsors that have, uh, moved to other companies and, and we've continued that business and that relationship. So I'm, I'm so happy to hear that that's in place for you. Um, how about you, Mike? Obviously, you know, you got to oversee all those great uh, uh, turntable battles back in the 90s and stuff. You know, they, I think they forced you to retire because um, you won too many. Um, and, you know, and you guys have not only through that, I'm sure, got to see so many great young artists come up. Um, I'm sure the Beasties took out so many great artists that you're probably same so proud Papa now that you know these bands have gone on to other uh, great things. Uh, you know, what would you say for the the next generation? Uh, for the next generation, uh, have the mindset to pay it forward, and that's my key to success. Have the mindset to yeah pay it forward. Um, always keep both sides of the street clean. Um, and hey, I mean, my faith in the Lord is everything, you know what I mean? He's my ultimate guide and my protection, so it's like, I can't lose without him, so it's, uh, you know, we all have a higher power, right, whether it's Buddha or, or God or whatever, but that, you know, you, using your higher power for the greater good and using your platform to change lives and um, make a difference, ultimately you want to make a difference. Look, I'm a musician, I could do, you know, I could do this in my sleep, but what are you really doing at the end of the day if you're not here? If you're not here, what would you have regrets about? And for me, it's all about paying it forward, and shout out to uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and Operation Smiles, and Bogle Alcove, and, and all of my charities, and that's all, paying it forward. Incredible, thank you. <laughs> any, any final words, Diana? I feel, I feel that the most important thing is how you treat people in this business because um, just like you all said, um, I've been doing this for so long and some of the people that worked in the mail room at Capitol Records are now people that I need in my life. Yeah. And not that that's the reason, you know, but it doesn't, it, it's, it's not so hard just to say thank you. And especially being an artist, like I talked to Travis and Mike and all my artists that I work with because I don't care about making money. If I'm gonna book you on a show, then you are also representing me, and you, may, you will make my life more difficult, and you're gonna make the difficult life of the people that are paying you money. You gotta check yourself and remember, you are a drummer, and you are a DJ, and you're doing what you love to do. And just remember when you're in your room wishing that you were in a band and wishing that you were a singer, don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget that because I see you know, the up and coming artists are the most difficult ones because they really think that oh, I know what you know. It's like they they are kind of difficult, but I I, I try to try to teach them some things sometimes. But um, just the relationships, um, how you treat people, and don't ever forget. Like there's sometimes people will come to us and say we've got two thousand dollars for Mixed Master Mike, and I say yes sometimes because it depends on what it's for. It's free sometimes. And I talked to Mike about that in the beginning, because in the beginning, it was a struggle, you know? He, um, he was with the Beastie Boys, and Beastie Boys are epic in doing, like, big things. And I had to talk to Yalk and say, this guy's opening up your shows. Can we, can we fix this situation? And Yalk was so unbelievable with family. Um, love you, Yalk. And so um, he really understood, and he changed Mike's life. That day I talked to him, and it's artists and agents and managers all of us together just have to like stretch a little bit, you know? Don't be so tough. My advice is to just respect the people that you work with. Remember where you came from. Don't always try to get the higher dollar if somebody's genuine. And agents and managers, you know, if, a, if an artist is struggling, why do you have to take your full commission every single time? My mom says I don't respect myself because I don't care about money. But I feel like I do because I care about 
artist, and because of that, they care about me. So that's my main thing is, is just respect. If I could, uh, and we're gonna take some questions um, from the audience. First of all, thank you everybody, incredible. Um, you know, last night, you know, you've mentioned Marty Collin a lot. Last night we had a, a great event for honoring Marty, and um, I think there's we one more to Marty. sum up. And, and Mike, is Marty, Marty here? Yeah. I'm not sure if he's here. I saw him earlier, Marty, but Marty, Marty. I love um, him. It, the, the, the one thing I strive to do in my life is to be a mensch, you know, and, and that guy is a mensch, and uh, everything you guys just said is very menschy, too. Um, so, if you can learn anything, a little Yiddish today, be a mensch, it, it'll go a long way, uh, and, uh, you know, we should all have such a wonderful life and career and family as, as Marty does, you know, it's really, really inspiring. So, uh, we're going to take some uh, questions from the, from the audience here for, for the panelists. Um, oh, Got a question in the back. Um, hi, thank you for the panel. Um, so I'm on the talent booking side, and I just wanted to know, like, any practical tips on metrics you might use to determine what your offer would be. You got it? Before I get that back. All right, I'm going to give you one of my secret formulas. <laughs> uh, I think social media is really, really important. When you're evaluating an artist, you have it, it's free. You, uh, Pulsar is also really great. Yeah. But um, look, at, look at their views. Look at their comments. Look at how many people they have on it. I just got quoted... $25,000 for an artist who had like less than a thousand views on social media, that doesn't equate to me. That's not an artist that I'm gonna book. It's such a disservice to the artist to overprice like that because that artist needs to work so that those views get up. And then that artist is gonna be making whatever that artist will be making. But use social media a lot, L evaluate it, because if the social media is really, really strong, you'll start getting it. Oh, it's 100,000 views. That's 5,000 or 7,000 or 10,000. It's 80 million views. That's 750,000. Do you know, I mean, there you can really use that to kind of figure out where you're gonna land. But again, always ask for the fee range because Agents, in defense of agents, I mean, they're not always super nice, but, um, and some of them are when you, you know, they are, they are when you're in a relationship with them, yeah. I'm not trashing agents, I love them, and I have great relationships with agents, but when you're starting out, I mean, it can be tough. Um, they're stressed out, they're underpaid, and, um, and they've got way too many artists that they're dealing with. Um, and so you're kind of, you know, you're dealing with, the human factor of someone who just has too much on their plate and, and they're trying to do the best for their artist and they might look at your festival like it's too small. And then perseverance. I can't tell you how many times I called until I, until I got callbacks, but eventually if you bug them, they just want you to go away. <laughs> They'll call you back just, you know, and then you make your offer, but I hope that's helpful. I call that like a, I'm a polite punisher. Um, you know, that you have to, every email has to be like, it's the first one. Like, hi, just checking in. Hi, circling back. Hi, gently checking in. Um, I, any way you could say I'm circling back, I've said. Um, also, uh, there's a great app I use once called, uh, we use called Chartmetric. Um, some of you might know, but it's an aggregator of all social media, streaming and everything else, and I can look at that in real time. Um, uh, same deal, I look at engagement, not likes, right? There'd be, there could be a band on Facebook that hit it big in 2008 and gained all these followers and they all left, um, you know, and there's no engagement. Uh, we signed, uh, for my graphic novel company, we signed an artist who's now gone on to do great things, but it was, his name was Youngblood. We, he had very low engagement. I mean, he had very low followers when we found him, but the engagement was that of a band four or five times his size. We never saw anything like it. And we took a risk and signed him to do a graphic novel deal. Um, and it, it completely took off because he, the audience caught up, but you could see the engagement level on social media. And to your point, 
It's free. It's a free. It's go. It's right there. You know, go check it out. Um, Polestar shares those numbers. Um, I look at. I get ticket counts every week from every venue. I look at merch number. Merch numbers. I think tell a lot too. That if someone's going the extra mile to buy something, um, that's not a passive. If someone's like, we have Bubba. The, the the least important metric. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody. Is streaming numbers. I don't. It doesn't. Tell me anything, because um, it's the most passive thing you could ever do. You're not showing up at a concert. You're not buying a physical thing. You're not buying a shirt. Um, you're just saying, I, I'd like to give you, I'd like to take this penny and break it into the smallest fraction and maybe maybe give it to you. So uh, there could be some more engaging ways to go about that. Yeah. We're all done? All right, well, guys, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I'll be back at 4 o'clock for another panel. But thank you, Lori, uh, Phoebe, everybody else here. It's amazing. Appreciate your time. Hey, everyone. Uh, in about 10 minutes, if you have to go to the bathroom, go now, or it's probably worth it to hold it because Marty and Dane Cook will be here. So, and here's Lori for some announcements. Um, just a couple of quick announcements, and thank you to this amazing panel. They are very gracious to be here and share with you. Um, we are going to have the Puppy Palooza at 1 with lunch. That'll be outside. Dane Cook and Marty are coming up, and we're also going to be um, giving away our festival things for those who signed up yesterday. And one more thing, we're going to have you guys take photos, tag it for Instagram, at Festforms, and at Dane Cook. And everybody who does so, I have a big old chocolate bar from Headcount for you. Nice. It's good before lunch. All right, let's, let's, um, can we hold the music? So all the names, there were 57. There were 57 people who registered. Do they have to be here to win? Okay, so. If they are here, come up. If they're here, they can come up and pick their envelope. If you're here, you can pick your envelope. Which festival? Elizabeth Rosa. Elizabeth Rosa, are you here? Okay, I guess she's a winner. You don't have to be here to win, we said. We have a lot more comedy. I work with Jeff Klein and Alex as well. We have episode books. We do a lot of stuff. Jessica Hale. She's, uh, I know, she's Sugarlands. Romy Brock. Romy Brock. Oh, you get to pick? And they're good. Good festivals. No, no. You can pick whichever one you want. No, no. That's yours. Which one is it? You can look at the front. Snowman International Film. Oh, nice. That's a good film festival. That's another one. Oh, she picked it up. Okay. You sure did. Good job. Becca Gokin. Becca Gokin. They came in the morning and then they drank too much last night, didn't they? I know what we'll do then. We can pick again if you want later. But it's up to you. Paige Sheehan. Okay. That's it. <laughs> I got them all. That's 